Welcome to the Pinelander Podcast, the official podcast of Pineland, broadcasting to you from an undisclosed location deep inside Pineland, where we discuss faith, family, finances, firearms, freedom, food, and everything else in between with those who believe in living free and living out the values that made this country free. Welcome to the Pine Lantern Podcast. Today is uh, Friday, the 28th of July, 2023. I'm here with my good friend, Mike Blackburn, and uh, just kind of getting moved into the new G-Base. And as we got moved into the new G-Base, one thing I wanted to do is uh, maybe get some uh, retread on an episode uh, that uh, I don't think got enough love. Uh, that was episode number 13, The Wild Fields, from March 4th, 2022. Yeah, it's been a while. It is. I mean, it's our first novel. Uh, I'm also excited because we're excited because it's going to be an audio book mm-hmm. soon. We hope it's going to be ready this fall. Uh, and uh, it's it's about um, one man's uh, fight to preserve his family in the Ukraine. Um, this is in, The funny thing about the book is uh, I finished it about a week before Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine before they crossed the, the, the book the book accurately <laughs> the book was almost prophetic yeah uh, it's crazy. because the uh, the book actually uh, alluded to the fact that the invasion was coming yeah at the end and um, so hopefully your book didn't cause the invasion uh, but it certainly came right after <laughs> <laughs> but it certainly came at the end of at the end of the book, and um, we're just calling them out. We're just, I mean, it was, are you going to do it or not? Well, you and I were both shocked. <laughs> we're like, you know, what's, you know, oh my goodness. But um, you know, Ukraine's in the news um, every day. Um, yeah, and it's a great and it's a great story that takes place uh, right there in the muck of it. So if you if you have a curiosity about the area and how the people live and the uh, the customs and the religion and and uh, the Donbass area has been going on. Uh, that struggle in the Donbass area has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, if you just want to just get smart about uh, that part of the country, this is a great read. And we are very excited about the audio book because um, the, guy, it, the guy that's doing the audio work on it, and it's, it's, not, it's not Paul, uh, the, the guy has really done. So I couldn't do it. Well, the guy <laughs> the, the guy has been doing a great job. I Fantastic. Mean, his, his work with voices and everything is yeah. just phenomenal. So, yeah. Um, if you if you have read the book or haven't read the book, uh, you'll definitely I think enjoy the audio. All right, welcome to the Pine Land Podcast. My name is Paul Lefaver. I'm here with my Ranger buddy Mike Blackburn, and today is Friday, March the fourth, two thousand twenty-two. Well, we've got a Really special episode today, uh, Paul. It's not too often that we actually get to really talk about um, our projects, our personal projects. Uh, but anyway, we're going to talk about your uh, latest book. It's a novel. It's your first novel, uh, "The Wild Fields: A Fight for the Soul of Ukraine." Um, you started this last year. Um, and I remember talking about this book over several meetings as far as kind of like the direction it was going and, and what did you want to, what, what you wanted to achieve with this, uh, this novel. And I remember the whole time we were kind of sitting around joking, um, because, you know, Ukraine was kind of slowly, uh, heating up. You were hearing a little more about it in the news. And so we used to always kind of joke, you know. Uh, yeah. This book's going to be great, just as long as we kind of maintain some status quo here and nothing really goes crazy. Um, but anyway, it's it's here. Um, a lot of things have been happening in Ukraine, and uh, Ukraine is definitely on the on the radar. And your book is very timely. Yeah, it's uh, this is exciting. Uh, it's an exciting time to be alive. Uh, but I just want to let our listeners know that uh, I actually uh, wrote this book. Uh, before the invasion, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I didn't kick out a uh, hundred, uh, two hundred and seventy-four page novel, fifty-seven thousand uh, words in a weekend. Yeah. You didn't, you didn't yeah. just crank that out in one yeah. weekend. I don't think so. Uh, but this is, in fact, my first novel. So uh, a little caveat to that. Uh, up to this point, uh, I've been writing only reference books, uh, both military and uh, Christian works. So this is uh, this was a challenge. Uh, I wanted to. 
I wanted to write a novel uh, about the Donbass conflict, uh, as everyone knows, it's between uh, the sovereign state of Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and there's a whole lot you could say with that right there, but it's really I wanted to have uh, an unconventional warfare narrative uh, to kind of showcase uh, the, the the odds and ends of what happens in uh, unconventional warfare, NUW. And I thought that was the first thought. I wanted something where uh, people could figure out how does this work? What does this look like on the ground? And it started off like that, but then I kind of fell in love with the characters, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's an old saying uh, that you you make the characters, you develop them, and then you kill them off. And uh, that's kind of what's going on. A lot of that's what's going on in the book. Yeah, there's there's really, I remember we were wanting to do a novel um, either from another author or, you know, you were going to try your hand at it. And, you know, we wanted to kind of incorporate a lot of things that we have familiarity with from our military experience. And, you, you know, you could have, you know, this, this, this novel could have taken place any place geographically. I mean, there's That's plenty true. of, uh, you know, operations out of the war, if you want, if you want to call it that, uh, irregular warfare events taking place all over the world. Um, for whatever reason, you just, you, you chose the Don the Donbass region of Ukraine, uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, and, of course, that's a long, it's a, one of many areas in the world that there's, you know, been a lot of things going on. Um, <laughs> you know, for whatever reason, you chose that 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 area, started writing about it, and then bam. You yeah, know, that's, that's, Russia, that's, Russia blessed across the, the border, which is yeah. kind of just, which is kind of just a, uh, I don't know. I don't know if you have like the you know the crystal ball there or what, but no, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, but uh, uh, I did. Yeah, I was interested in this region. It's been a global hot spot for a while, uh, and so my initial interest was obviously the flashpoint in 2014. I was working out at Small Unit Tactics, and you know, lo and behold, uh, you know, Russia moved into the Crimea. There was uh, talks of little green men. Uh, the hybrid form of warfare that they were uh, using. And we're just kind of following really close. And that was the first time that I, uh, it kind of hit the blip on my radar screen. Uh, and then, uh, then I discovered Ukraine Life Map. Uh, I started to get into the minutia of what's going on, uh, kind of the playbook, uh, Putin's playbook, if you will, and how he was uh, conducting things. Uh, I was looking at uh, UW in general. Of course, you know I'm out at the uh, uh, the course, and so I'm uh, I'm teaching that. But uh, that was I look I I, f- I first I was uh, just flabbergasted by what was going on, and then it's kind of like when you peel back the layers of an onion, you just kind of find more stuff, more and more stuff, and then I uh, but it. I kind of fell asleep. I kind of fell asleep in my brain because I had so many other projects on my plate, but uh, I think it was just really looking at UW and, and going back into the doctrine again and reading the pubs and all that stuff. And then I looked at this and I thought, you know, this could be useful to really showcase how this is done and kind of flesh out, you know, how uh, things are done in the UW environment. And uh, that's that's really it. And then I just kind of, but I, I started with that, and then it went to uh, a bigger, a larger uh, narrative, and that is good versus evil. Yeah, I think I think what's really um, fun about this book is you've really taken um, all of your experiences, you know, all of your education, you know, everywhere the Paul of favor has been. And, you know, you, you, you've really just thrown it all into this novel, yeah, yeah, which, right. which, uh, I find kind of challenging because people be like, Hey man, what's it about? So I'm going to ask you right now, like if, you know, how would you describe this novel? Because to be honest with you, um, it's, there's a, it's a lot of jewels in this thing. It's, it's not just one topic or one subject matter. Yeah. I mean, there, uh, as, uh, one of my heroes, uh, historian, uh, J. Rufus Fears, uh, he's the, the late, one of the late uh, historians, professors at uh, University of Oklahoma. He said a great 
book has essentially has a great theme. Uh, it can speak across the ages. It's written in noble language and speak to us and speaks to us individually. And so, uh, really, I want this the book. I want it to be able to do all those things, and it has uh, one major theme, and that is uh, essentially. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that's really the theme. Uh, now, that's that being said, uh, there is character development. There's a, a primary character. His name is Pavel Koval. He's a guy that has some issues. He's been in the Soviet-Afghan war. He's the uh, quintessential Ukrainian that was drafted into the Russian army, the Red Army, and that uh, had to do uh, his two or three years in Afghanistan. And then he brought a bunch of baggage with him. So he's got all of that stuff. So that's part of the book. And then it's essentially about him and his struggle uh, to really come to grips with his past, come to grips with his future, and, and his present. So it's all of that. It's past, present, future of who he is and kind of uh, coming off the fence, as, you, as they say. Yeah, you've got. Uh, I mean, these are not perfect people. These are flawed characters. Um, yeah. They're they're definitely people you can look up to and, and relate to, but they're not they're not they're not like uh, bigger than life. You know, they're not people that you can't yeah. really kind of relate to. Which is what what I really liked is is you know you can really relate to these people. They could be your neighbor or someone that maybe you've served with in the military. People that uh, have families, they have family issues. Um, they have. Uh, you know, things that give them nightmares at night. Um, kind of uh, what you see a lot of warriors doing, like maybe uh, um, trying to internalize and sort of uh, they're tough and they can kind of handle their own issues um, and, and maybe not doing that well of a job at it. Um, but I think it's, it's you know, the novel is, is really, um, besides the characters that are very interesting characters, I think the other aspect of this novel that I really like is it's it's sort of that part of the I don't I hate to call it espionage because it's, it's really not I don't really consider it an espionage thriller yeah but it is kind of like that in in the fact that it really uh, brings to light sort of a uh, part of what takes place every day in this world uh, that a lot of people are not really that familiar with I mean let's face it I love a Jason I love a good Jason Bourne movie i love a good jason Bourne novel but yeah. let's be honest jason Bourne doesn't exist okay yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he's a fun guy um your characters are real and they do exist and the type of activity that you talk about in the in the book uh happens every day in, in this country so it's really kind of fun um most people are kind of used to the kinetic sort of uh engagements that uh that take place this is non-kinetic in, in most regards, but yeah. there are some kinetic events. But it's kind of a lot, it's a lot of fun as far as in that, that sort of espionage realm that a lot of times is not really discussed. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly wanted that uh, to be, rel- uh, you know, to, to fly off the page. Uh, I wanted these, I mean, these characters are definitely real. Uh, they're definitely people that we can associate with. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, uh, my favorite novels are, uh, have uh, a protagonist that I can uh, associate with. This is not a perfect person. This is a flawed person. And I think that's uh, really important, in, uh, at least in American literature, is that we have a tradition that shows that. We'll showcase our weaknesses. We just tell it like it is. Um, so, um, And then something you noted earlier is um, really Pavel, his struggle, the essence of his struggle is really, and it's, this is uh, not a spoiler here. He has PTSD, and it should become apparent, although it's not spelled out in a clinical form. But uh, for those you know joining us, uh, there's really uh, four, uh, essentially four recognized PTSD symptom clusters. As uh, and that sounds highfalutin, but if you were to crack the uh, uh, the DSM five, uh, the diagnostics. Uh, uh, manual that covers this, you'll find there's a uh, re-experiencing of the similar type of instances. He definitely has that. He finds himself kind of re-experiencing sights and sounds that kind of throw him in a tizzy, and he has to deal with that. He'll have uh, avoidance 
or feeling numb. And, uh, you know, Pavel certainly does that. And he has to fight through this. So this the other is uh, he's hyper uh, active. He has hyper arousal. Uh, so he's just really tuned in. Certain loud noises kind of, uh, you know, set him off. And then, of course, he's got these negative thoughts and feelings. He's got uh, uh, the, all of these together uh, is a big challenge for him. And a, a big part of it, a big part of the book is the spiritual component of Pavel. So having said everything I just said, he has to come to grips with that. He, the book reminds you that there's a spiritual component to being a man, and, and that's something that we often blow off. But, you know, men have souls. You know, everybody has a soul, of course, duh. But there's a part of you that's going to uh, live on when you've shuffled off this mortal coil. And that's something that Pavel really shows us is you have to, uh, there's a spiritual component. And for those of us that just poo-poo that and, and never uh, work on that component, they, they're, they're, uh, they're lesser men. That's really it. And they, they, they hold a lot of baggage. And they could uh, find themselves in a dark night of the soul if they don't deal with these things, especially ghosts from their past. Yeah, it's got it's got a little of something uh, for everybody, and I, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I when I read the novel, um, first and foremost, I learned a lot about just Ukraine in general. Yeah, I mean, you bring a lot of. Uh, I mean, you're almost like there, you know, when you read the novel, which of course is you know you yeah. needed to do that for me because I've never been to Ukraine. But um, the diet, you know, uh, the customs, um, kind of the way. Uh, things work, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, I mean, you really bring bring to life uh, that part of the world. And uh, so it's it's really interesting as far as just kind of learning about Ukraine and the culture. Um, he has a large family. Your main yeah. character has a very yeah. large family. He's dealing with, uh, this is not uncommon either for that, for that region for yeah. you know, a lot of folks to be living together. Well, actually, I think most places in the world, it's not uncommon to be living with grandpa and grandma, you know, and the kids and everybody's kind of piled in one roof or at least um, are very close and meet generally very often. Um, so, you know, you bring a lot of that, which is a little foreign to Americans, yeah. you know, um, and all the, all the dynamics of that, okay, um, and, and all the relationships. So while he's dealing with his own issues, you know, he's having to deal with this very large extended family and and has to concern themselves with that as well. Yeah. Um, so that's it's a, a lot of fun. Yeah. That's uh, a big part of uh, the U- Ukrainian culture uh, is you're, you don't, they don't have nursing homes. <laughs> right. You know? They, they, uh, they don't just, they don't, that's not in their uh, fabric and they just, that's just how it is. Yeah. I think it's good. I think we have a lot that we can learn from them. Oh, I, I've always admired cultures that, uh, you know, when, when you go out on a date, you know, grandpa goes along as well, you know, um, the whole family just kind of hangs out in all the events, you know. Yeah. Uh, but besides that, I mean, I ain't gonna lie to you. I mean, I, you know, you're a good friend of mine. We've talked about this book while you were writing it, and you threw me for quite a few surprises that I didn't see uh, coming. So, uh, you know, you're reading the book, and I'll be honest with you, um, it's a page turner. It's gonna be hard to set down, and uh, you will surprise your reader. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. have some things that. You know, you're just like, wait, like what? Like yeah. I didn't see that coming. So, it's a lot of fun, um, and I, I'm sure it's going to do very well. Um, let's talk about this cover, man. This cover is phenomenal. I did. Who who uh, who did this for you? Yeah. So, uh, what's awesome about uh, uh, having a family with talent is uh, they can contribute to stuff like this. So, the uh, the cover was actually done by my daughter, my oldest daughter, Leanne, uh, and basically. I just described what I wanted, and she made it. And uh, so she does a phenomenal job with that. Uh, yeah, the cover really, if you look at the front, uh, that's essentially what it is. It's the front line. Uh, so it's set before uh, the Russian invasion of 24 February, uh, and it's actually set in 2019. And so uh, the, there's guys in the trenches. They're facing off with the, pro, uh, the Rus- pro-Russian separatists of the of the. Uh, Oblast of Luhansk, and so you've got the Ukrainian flag flying there. You've got the the trizub, which is the trident, the symbol of Ukraine on the front, and then in the back, uh, you've got uh, the wolf, which 
symbolizes uh, the pro-Russian uh, insurgents, which are behind uh, the friendly lines running amok. And, you know, they're nef- they're, they're, there's so many nefarious activities that they have. And in between them, between the bad guys and the good guys, is the church. And so that's another aspect of it is the Orthodox Church of uh, Ukraine as a huge component in the book. And so you're amongst the culture, you're also immersed in their theology and the uh, church life of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah, which means a lot to them. I mean, these are yeah. church-going people generally. It's, it's huge. Uh, but that's really the cover. And then you've got uh, also the colors. Yeah, it's very bold. Yeah, so it's supposed to just uh, smack you in the face. It does. Uh, you've got uh, <laughs> you've got the red uh, of the idea of uh, of, of an attack of uh, Russian aggression, and then you've got the burgundy more of the. Well, you were very secretive about this. Yeah. Uh, generally, you and I work very closely on most of your projects. This thing here, you're kind of you kind of kept this kind of close hold. Yeah, I wanted to be a, like a secret weapon. Um, and so it kind of, uh, it was, I'll be honest, the, the whole invasion of Ukraine is bis- disheartening for many reasons. Obviously, it's evil. Uh, it's cruel. Uh, there's war crimes being perpetrated. Uh, and, you know, besides all of that, I, I took it as a personal affront, all right, <laughs> that he messed up my book. I hate to say it like that. Well, I thought, oh, gosh, you know, now you've messed up. And I, and I know you and I have had conversations yeah. about this. Now, of course, I, you know, we will have to just agree to disagree on yeah. this. But what I like about your book is, um, I mean, let, let's, let's face it. It sounds selfish that I said it like that, but I, well, I no, did think it. it. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I understand that. Um, but, you know, I mean, the reports that I'm hearing is, you know, the trenches are still being dug. You know, they're yeah. being dug around the cities. So, I mean, I know we have a trench line over here in in, uh, you know, these eastern provinces. But yeah. um, I think if you travel throughout Ukraine, you're going to see trench lines now. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, too, is Putin didn't just wake up one morning and decide to invade Ukraine. That's true. Uh, so I think what, what your novel also does is provide a lot of that useful backdrop yeah. in all the activities leading up to this invasion. I mean, this is something he, had, he has had on his mind per, for probably a decade from what the experts say, maybe, I, maybe yeah. longer. I would say that's true. Uh, I'm I am no expert on this conflict, and uh, I'm an expert at nothing, honestly. Uh, that's the ex- expression. Green Berets were, you know, uh, you know, masters of nothing, right? We just tinker with everything. But uh, honestly, that's true. You had uh, 04 was the Orange Revolution. Uh, that was really the early rumblings on uh, Ukraine's identity. Wanted to throw off uh, pro Putin, pro. Russian puppet leaders, uh, that failed. And then uh, Yanukovych uh, in 2014, we all know, uh, was teetering on the uh, plane with the idea of joining the EU or at least preparatory documents to that end. Uh, of, co- of course, you can see Vladimir uh, Putin calling him saying, hey, what's going on? Uh, so that was uh, corrected uh, midstream. And when that did, there was a big backlash. The Ukrainian people, uh, they wanted no more of that. They didn't want to join Russia. They're not Russian, even though uh, Putin, at least in his mind, thinks they are. And uh, that, that was it. That's what started this. That's what perpetuated the Donbass being occupied also with Crimea. And I think, and that's where I'm going with this, I think that was, in his mind, what he was trying to do right now. And it just didn't go as far uh, and honestly, I'll be true, true to form is the Ukrainian people, uh, that woke them up that gave Ukraine more of an identity. It had one already, but more of an identity, uh, than it ever had. And it woke the people up to, Hey, if we do nothing, that's how wicked, that's how uh, evil is going to triumph here. And, uh, that's, but yeah, it, it definitely was in his mind for a while. And well, so. And it drives me crazy because, I mean, you know, the main, if you watch mainstream media, it's almost like, it's just, it's almost ridiculous. Um, the notion that because you speak Russian, yeah, you are a big fan of Putin or somehow you have this affinity towards Russia. That's not necessarily the case, especially not absolutely Ukraine. Not. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, and that's really a big part of the book also is uh, the book is actually set in uh, the town of uh, Zolote, 
which is in the Luhansk Oblast, uh, one of the breakaway republics. But it's actually in the Ukrainian-held portion. And But everybody around there speaks Russian. So the point is, just because you speak Russian doesn't mean you're, you're a Russian because the people that, uh, you know, in that part, they say, hey, I'm a Ukrainian, and uh, rightfully so. And so it, dis- it tries to dispel the myth that language is your identity. It's not. Yeah, and, and of course, you and I both know that you know, there's places in this country. I know I've been to them. Uh, one of my favorite places to go in the U.S. is San Antonio, Texas. I absolutely yeah. love that place. Uh, yeah, it's fun. And, I, and I've place. worked and I've worked down there, you know, for months. Uh, I'll be honest with you. There's places in San Antonio that they do not speak English. Yeah, that's uh, true. But if you try to convince them that they're not American, um, you're going to have some problems. Yeah, it's just like Puerto Rico. I mean, they speak Spanish in Puerto Absolutely. Rico, but I believe they consider themselves Americans. They do. They do. So that's, it's it's yeah. not unlike a lot of you know. If you look at it that way, uh, Eastern Ukraine is a lot kind of like that. Would you agree, Paul? Absolutely. You have uh, basically uh, as any. Uh, any expert in the field could tell you, uh, if you, you draw a line between Kharkiv uh, in the north to Odessa in the south, uh, basically between those two major cities to, and you run east, that is essentially the Russian-speaking portion of Ukraine, by and large. Uh, but uh, the people in Odessa are decidedly not uh, Russian. They are Ukrainians. Uh, there was an attempt uh, to break away in uh, the early at the same time that Crimea was falling, and the Ukrainian people of Odessa had nothing of that. In fact, there was, uh, you know, a lot of people lost their lives in trying to uh, do something similar to the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. So uh, it's a sad uh, story that uh, you have people that are deluded into thinking that there's uh, – there's some type of country that will be called Nova Russia or New Russia. And that's really just, and this is part of a larger, uh, uh, part of the narrative is the Russians are experts in uh, I.O., uh, in, in crafting a narrative and in information operations where they just use, uh, and nefariously and tyrannically they do this, is to really just, uh, get a whole population to sway on a certain idea. And, you know, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek because there are a lot of people in Luhansk Oblast and Donetsk Oblast that they are not down with this either. And they're just, un, uh, for self-preservation or preservation of their family, they have to go along with the powers that be. And so we know that too, uh, as we see, uh, you know, for the last week, People in St. Petersburg are protesting the war. The Russian people are protesting this, and rightfully so, because they know it's wrong. So, the, I mean, the problem is this. Here's my. So, I'm just trying to say is the problem is not the Russian people. It's the tyrannical government of Putin. That's really the problem. So, the Russian people are essentially good folks. Okay, they are an enigma. All right, as Churchill says, within. Uh, and I, I screw him up the, the quote here, but a secret within an enigma, within a riddle or whatever. But that's essentially true. But their food is awesome. Their literature is great. I love Dostoevsky. I love Tolstoy. Uh, The music is awesome. And it sucks that the Russian people, by and large, have to suffer because they have sucky government. And that's really is what has happened since uh, 1917. But that's part of it. What I wanted to show is, hey, just because you speak Russian doesn't mean you're bad. Uh, it's like these these people in Ukraine that are decidedly Ukrainian, they're patriotic, and they'll die for Ukraine. They speak Russian. Well, this isn't a pro-war book, and it's not an anti-war book. Right. It just um, it is what it is. It just kind of is yeah. what it is, which is kind of neat. It's it's. Uh, I mean, I know, you know, as charged as the political environment is, uh, especially here in, in the U.S., um, I think people might look at this and go, well, you know, what is this? this is some kind of like you know, this is kind of like a pro you know, U.S. involvement in Ukraine book, or is this like a, an anti-U.S. involvement in Ukraine book? And it's neither of those. Um, it's very refreshingly sort of Ukrainian. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could have written the book in Ukrainian, and yeah. you probably would have done just fine because it's really a book for Ukrainians. Absolutely. That is, uh, that's the essence of it. If you just squeeze the whole book out, it's about Ukrainians uh, who at the time uh, were on the fence. And, you know, I... 
I, I would be, I think we'd be hard pressed right now to go to Ukraine and find somebody still on the fence. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, I, it's one of those, I mean, when someone invades and crosses your yeah. border, I mean, it's time to like make a decision. Yeah. And people are willing to die for what they believe. And that's really uh, your values. Uh, what you value is going to have, uh, uh, you know, exert immense uh, uh, influence on what you believe. You're going to live out what you believe. And these people believe in freedom. They're not going to go back uh, and live under the, the Iron Curtain. And they certainly aren't going to be slaves of Putin. And so they're willing to die for that. So I applaud them. And I, I'm sure everyone else watching uh, feels the same way, at least in the West. Well, it's an awesome book, and it's an enjoyable read. I, I sometimes have a hard time kind of getting through a book. Um, but this one wasn't hard at all. Um, it was very enjoyable all the way to the end. Um, is there going to be a sequel? I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, listen, things are happening like yeah. quick over that in that in that area. I mean, obviously, we don't know how things are going to turn out in Ukraine. It's uh, it's not looking like it's going to be as easy, maybe as some some might have thought it was for Putin. Yeah. I mean, it's looking like he's he's running into some really stiff resistance. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you got any thoughts about it, like I, another book? I do, um, and it's actually. Uh, from a flip side perspective. So in the wild fields, uh, essentially just look at good guys, bad guys. The good guys are the Ukrainians, and uh, there's a trench, of course, the bad guys are on the other side. Uh, but there's essentially, uh, in that context, the Ukrainians are really the underdogs in a sense. Uh, what I, I'm, Excuse me. They're an underdog in the sense that they're, they're battling it out with these insurgents that are pro-Russian. And then, so the idea on the flip side of the story in a, in a sequel, uh, you would see the Ukrainian insurgency against a nationwide uh, Russian, uh, you know, so oppressive like, government. So like an, uh, an assumption, uh, which I think most people are are um, stating today, that, that uh, Putin's intent is probably going to be um, to take uh, Kiev uh, install a puppet regime and then try to uh, support that regime and, and maintain its its uh, legitimacy and power. I believe that's true. Uh, I mean, albeit there's been uh, there's been some bizarre goings on uh, with the uh, a convoy that's so long it's kind of stalled out. We could only uh, you know uh, hazard a guess that they have logistical problems or they're waiting for something else to be uh, put in place. But I, I think they're. Their goal, based off of what we've seen so far, is to take the city centers, uh, decapitate the government of Kiev, uh, replace Zelensky with a puppet who will do Putin's bidding, and then not only that, but occupy the other uh, major cities like Mariupol, Odessa, Kharkiv, uh, Kherson. A lot of these cities have, uh, you know, at least Kherson has fallen, uh, but uh, they're going to get a bloody uh, nose indeed. Uh, trying to hold this down. Yeah, because, I mean, even with, when a city falls doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's uh, on board. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. everyone just kind of goes underground, don't they? I mean, <laughs> that's exactly the, uh, uh, I think, the spirit we see in them right now. They're going to go down fighting. Uh, Zelensky has said he's not going to go down without a fight. Uh, I believe he was asked for, a, uh, he wanted a way out of there. He said he didn't want to ride, but he wanted ammo. I mean, you got to applaud that. Yeah. Yeah, I wish we had leaders like that, right? I wish we did. Uh, but, yeah, I think, I think definitely uh, a sequel is in order. Uh, and I, I do, on a personal note, want to see uh, the development of some of these other characters. Uh, uh, there's some, some, you'll see some introduction of other characters, obviously, we haven't seen yet. And an, uh, an introduction of uh, more American involvement, of course. And that's something that uh, I'm proud of uh, as a nation that we're supporting Ukraine. I would like to see that in increasing ways. I know that what's the elephant in the room is the nuclear potential for this war to, uh, you know, you know, become something as disastrous as that. No one wants that. Uh, but uh, I, however it pans out, I would like to see. Uh, I know we're trained for this, so I mean, just spitballing. Ukraine falls, it's completely covered by uh, the Russian tricolor, and uh, those cities are running uh, insurgencies, uh, and then we have uh, an insurgent network, a 
across Ukraine, but supported by the allies. Uh, really, which you know we're we're prepared to do that, and I think in the long run it could be even. I mean, no one wants to see this, but potentially how things are going is it could turn into something like that. Our last big UW operation at this this country was involved in was Afghanistan. Um, Boy, yeah. and this would be which is a little different because Afghanistan is not a developed country by no by no sense of the imagination. Yeah. Um U- Ukraine um is I mean there's there's uh it it's, it's got a lot of large urban centers. It's not a super modern industrialized nation by no by no sense, but it is um uh, it's certainly not a third world nation by yeah. by no sense either. Uh an unconventional warfare environment in a place like Ukraine would definitely be interesting. I think it would. I mean, that is, uh, I mean, uh, a word that comes to mind is um, untenable. Uh, the The Russians to, um, I mean, obviously, first off, their counterinsurgency methods are artillery striking cities, and we see that. Uh, they're just going to continue to do that. So uh, I think they they would need more men than they have more money than they have, than they've ever seen. It would be the biggest disaster, I think, that the Russians have ever been involved in. To include 1917 when they left the Allied side uh, fighting the Central Powers. That could be absolutely uh, catastrophic. Uh, so this is, this is bad for everybody. But yeah, uh, because of uh, Ukraine is not you know, Afghanistan, and uh, the things they got away with there, uh, I would hope they would not get away with here. Because they got away with uh, murder, genocide, uh, terrible things. And so I, f- I would love to, uh, I would love to see us roll up our sleeves and do a little bit more. I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, but uh, I definitely see bl- uh, a bloody nose coming to the Russians if they attempt that. Yeah, I mean Europe has been sort of a, a region of the world that we've kind of taken, to, to, you know, for granted. Uh, yeah. I remember the entire time I was on active duty. I mean, nobody really worried about uh, war breaking out, you yeah. know, in Europe. You know, it was kind of a stalemate. Um, you know, the Cold War was kind of going on. I mean, yeah. but this is really, I mean, this is kinetic. This has really kind of surprised me. Um, I, 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 you know, you and I spoke about this. I had my doubts that the Russians were going to invade. Proves that, you know, yeah. proves I was wrong. Really surprised us all. Um, I didn't see that coming. I thought yeah. he was just, uh, you know, doing the normal type of things that Putin, did, Putin does. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's got tanks rolling across the board. Um, yeah. That's that's phenomenal. Um, I I don't want to see a big east-west you know, yeah. tank battles in Europe. I mean, I think we've, we've done that show a couple of times, and I think everyone's yeah. kind of burned out on it. But I do see... What you're what you're talking about, uh, sort of this unconventional operations other than war, irregular warfare sort of environment playing out. Um, so it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting to watch. And uh, the wild fields uh, is a is a book that's on time. I mean, if you really want to understand this region and the kind of people that live there and the kind of um, issues that they've uh, been experiencing for quite some time, uh, the wild fields is definitely a great read. I thank for your uh, thank you for your confidence. <laughs> well, I, mean, I hope I, our listeners will feel the same way. Well, I'll be honest with you. For uh, you know your first novel, my goodness, you hit it out of the park. Um, you know, just to let few uh, you know our listeners know, um, you know, it has been reviewed. It has been uh, edited professionally. Um, a lot of you know, we, Paul's gotten a lot of uh, kudos from a lot of folks out there that have been very impressed with the book. So. Um, for your first novel, a uh, fantastic job. I think, uh, I think uh, it's going to do very well. And, of course, you've got some events coming up. We had an event coming up at Barnes & Noble's uh, next week. Yeah. So we're going to kind of profile you. So, uh, you know, keep looking out there. We're definitely uh, – the book is going to be picking up steam. It's going to be uh, wherever you get your books, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever. I mean, it's available now. Uh, get, get the book. Read the book. Enjoy the book. Tell your friends about the book. The summer's yeah. coming. It's time to read, right? Amen. Uh, God bless America. Glory to Ukraine.
All right, our guest today was Paul LeFevre, and uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Pineland Podcast. Uh, if you enjoy our content and our unique perspective, we hope uh, you'll check out our sponsors. Blacksmith Publishing has a lot of great titles to include the Wild Fields, available in the bookstore at blacksmithpublishing.com. Again, that's blacksmithpublishing.com. And if you're looking for some cool Pinelander merchandise, head on over to the general store located at pinelanders1776.com. They've got a great selection of shirts, hats, jackets, sweaters, stickers, patches, and a whole lot more. Until next time, remember to keep your head on the swivel, stay physically and spiritually strong, morally and mentally straight, socially astute, and be a great team player. Viva La Pineland!